Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. As uh, Mark said tonight, we're very lucky to have an excellent speaker, a very high-profile speaker, Dr. Dennis DiNicola, who is a board-certified clinical pathologist. He's worked uh, on faculty at the University of Purdue in the US for uh, 21 years, I believe, mm -hmm. and um, some other high-profile roles in veterinary clinical pathology and then has been with IDEX for the last 12 years and is currently the Chief Veterinary Educator. And um, we were lucky enough at SASH to have a little private session last night where um, Dennis displayed his knowledge of haematology, but also his involvement in the genesis, the, you know, right through the rollout of the ProSite, which is you know, uh, IDEX's flagship instrument uh, for haematology which certainly I know a number of practices are utilising in Sydney, and we certainly do, and, and get a lot out of it. And I, I think tonight, uh, Dennis can help, help you um, get more out of that pe awesome piece of instrumentation. So mm -hmm. I'll uh, hand over to Dennis, and uh, everyone hopefully will enjoy the evening. Great. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, participating in Sash's continuing education activity. Um, I, I think. I think everything was said already. Are there any questions that we're done? Um, we, we're going to hopefully try to open your mind a little bit and, and think about hematology in a little different fashion. And um, one thing uh, you'll see that you have these little clicker devices. That to make sure you stay awake, I'm going to ask you to answer some questions as we go through the process. Um, does everybody have one? If not, we can get you one. We want you to answer a question. Um, and, and I tell people, don't worry about them. Your answers are anonymous, et cetera, but I have your DNA so I can find you later if I need to. Um, please leave those here because they are of no value to you. They will not turn your TV on, okay? Uh, but, it, but it's kind of valuable to me as well. Uh, and that, the, the talk is going to be uh, some general hematology, but I'm going to be focusing primarily on uh, the IDEX product, the ProSite, is just mentioned, and, and I'll show you why, um, why it's our flagship analyzer. We're really quite proud of it, and I'll show you why I'm proud of it as well. Um, hematology in general is something that many of us, I see enough gray hair out there that uh, we have lived through different hematology uh, systems over the evolution of veterinary hematology, which has pretty much paralleled that of human medicine and human hematology. And, and with each step of the evolution, we are correcting some of the deficiencies we had with the previous system. I, and I tell people, I'm afraid I lived the entire evolution here, um, maybe before the 80s uh, as well, uh, that I did a lot of manual CBCs. My research was based with manual CBCs. Um, I lived through the generation of the auto read or the QBC, which is a very basic instrument that was designed specifically for screening <coughs> healthy animals. And using it that way, it really has high value there. It gives you a lot of good information. Once you get to the abnormal populations of cells, when cells start varying sizes and everything, that's where the instrument starts to fail because it is assuming that all red cells, all platelets, all neutrophils, et cetera, are the same size for each species throughout life, uh, health or illness. Uh, and that does not take place. Uh, it, we see a lot of variability as we get to it, inflammatory disease, neoplastic disease, et cetera. So, so we knew the weak links there. And then we went into impedance technologies, and there's a lot of them out there in veterinary medicine. Um, and I know uh, the Abaxis HM5 is becoming more popular here. In Australia, there's the MinRay. There's, there are a series of impedance counters that all operate with very similar technology. And, and now we introduce a system that is extremely precise in measuring numbers or counting the numbers of cells in a set volume and measuring the volume of those cells. And, and using the variation in volume of cells or size of cells, it, it's helpful. That's how it uses the differentiation. How it differentiates a neutrophil from a lymphocyte and a monocyte is because it's larger than those cells. And, and the problem again comes in the fact that with our abnormal patients, size now gets a little muddy in there. The reactive lymphocytes are as big as a monocyte, maybe as big as a neutrophil. 
uh, monocytes, if they're very activated, will clearly be in the monocyte size. Platelets are always a problem. Well, they were a problem for many reasons, but with the impedance counters, we could never get an accurate platelet count in a cat because platelets are large and variably sized, typically in a cat. You just look at a cat and they get you know, giant in form. Um, but the red cells are smaller than most of our other mammalian cells, and there's an overlap in size. And with that, we tend to count platelets as red cells, or the big ones as red cells, and we count the small red cells as platelets, so we never really get a true platelet count off that analyzer. The differential for the leukocytes, we could get a really good three-part diff. A four-part diff, including eosinophils, is a little more of a struggle, so we had to work through that. Um, and, and we know there are deficiencies there. So that's what the introduction of the flow cytometry was. And, and that's exactly what the laser site did uh, when IDEX launched that 13 years ago now. Um, we provided an in-house laser flow cytometry, which I never would have expected to have happened, not in my lifetime. Uh, at Purdue, we were the first veterinary school to put in a hematology flow cytometry system. And, and that unit was so delicate that when you walk by it, if you bump the table, we had to have a technician in the lab for at least a day to realign the lasers. And, and now we put them in a box, send them in the truck, and drop them off the truck, and, and open them up, and it's a miracle that they work at all. But they do. Solid state laser flow cytometry is here. Um, even that unit, now using light scatter to define each individual cell, um, with a, its own little fingerprint. The light scatter associated with a neutrophil is different than that dramatically from a lymphocyte, from a red cell, or et cetera. And, and that light scatter, using about five different angles of light scatter, is collected, analyzed, and that's how we put the results out. But even that has some minor deficiencies. Um, we wanted better precision on the instrument. We wanted to get even better separation from platelets and red cells, which it does a much better job than an impedance counter, but it still lacked a little bit. And that's when we launched the, the flagship, if you would, the, the ProSite. And this was about a three and a half year process that, that we developed in conjunction with Sysmex Hematology Company out of Japan, which is the world's largest human hematology company. And we wanted their uh, expertise in instrumentation and development and manufacturing. They wanted our technology and how to classify cells and, and use the flow cytometry specifically for animal cells. So there was a merge in, in minds, if you would, and mechanics to make the ProSite. Uh, and, and as I said, we're really quite proud of that. And I'm going to show you a little bit about the ProSite uh, as we go through. I do need a little bit of a disclaimer, and that's the fact that I'm really proud of the ProSite. Uh, I was involved with it from day one in development, and, and, and I worked with uh, four universities around the world. Uh, John Harvey at the University of Florida, Al Rebar at Purdue University, um, Andreas Moritz in Gießen, Germany, uh, Kathy Trammell in Toulouse, France, uh, all experts in veterinary hematology and all very good friends. But more importantly, they're all operating with a different big hematology analyzer that you would see in the reference lab or an academic lab. And, and they had that unit for two and a half years before we launched the system. And I can't tell you how many thousands of samples that were well characterized by those universities, dog, cats, horse, and cow, to begin with, to, to develop this instrument. Um, far more than any other analyzer has ever looked at it from any species, whether it's IDEX development or uh, Advia with Siemens or Abbott with Celdyne with the bigger units that are there. We did a profoundly good job with that. And, and the neat part of it all is that we've demonstrated that the pro site with fresh samples can perform better than or equal to the big systems. And each of those schools operates their emergency and nighttime clinics with a pro site. Um, Purdue University is about to put two pro sites into their hospital as their primary hematology analyzer. Key opinion leaders around the world, and we have an international hematology advisory board, have bought into this system and understand how well it's working with us. Um, so I asked my boss, the CEO of IDEX, and my wife, my bosses, uh, and uh, they gave me permission to put pro site on my license plate, um, like a proud child. So 
what we're going to talk about now is the CBC, and everybody knows CBC stands for Complete Blood Count, so you would say, well, <laughs> that's a pretty silly title. You're talking about the complete, complete blood count. Um, but I think this is appropriate. It's, it's much like when we talk about urinalysis, clinical pathologists always talk about the complete urinalysis. There should be only one urinalysis, and, and that is that it includes the physical, the chemical, and the microscopic evaluation. Well, in hematology, there should be only one CBC that includes the data evaluation data generated by the analyzer, the cells that we look at in the microscope, and something that we do not do well in veterinary medicine, and this is a, a good job security thing for me to try to keep instructing people on how to use these. There are graphic representations that all of these analyzers provide people with really valuable data uh, and actually proves to be your probably your best quality assurance program you could have for your in-house hematology. And, and I'll try to walk through a couple examples specifically with the pro site. Um, so let's start with the data. Uh, data is, is, obviously, this is what we work with. We, veterinarians, even more than medical doctors, love numbers. Uh, in, in a, we were just talking in the back earlier that it's your responsibility to never accept these numbers blindly. Um, don't assume that the instruments perform properly. If the, if the data does not match your clinical picture, it's your obligation to find out, are those really true numbers? And that may be repeating a sample, whether it's chemistry or hematology, uh, maybe collecting a new sample and rerunning it, or sending the sample into a lab to do it with a different method. In hematology, we actually have the mechanism to verify the results very rapidly with those graphic exams, and, and we'll talk about them. But the data itself, in, in when you really boil it down, uh, many veterinarians just look at certain parts of the CBC or certain parts of the report that gets from the laboratory. Um, because of the complexity, because of all the different data that's being generated, and we generate now about 26 parameters for the veterinarian, more than you get back from the reference lab, more than you get back from the academic labs, um, because now having that in-house analyzer with a fresh sample, that's what these analyzers were designed to perform with. We can't give you some of the results from our reference lab because of the sample being 6, 12, 24 hours old. S the sample changes with time. So the fresh sample is by far the best. Even then, I tell people to break it down. Break it down into components. So like here's the red cell compartment, the white cell compartment, the platelet compartment. The reason for doing that is just like you do with chemistry. You break it down into kidney, liver, um, electrolyte, uh, acid-base balance. You try to break it down into smaller digestible pieces, and then you put it all together. In hematology, it's red, white, and platelets. Those are your three compartments or your, your three panels. And when you actually look at the data, boiling it down a little further, I think most people just look at the graphs. Um, this is something IDEX is originated this many years ago, and now a lot of companies have adopted it. Um, but they just look to see where my patient's results are, and they, they pray when it comes off the machine that it's all black. I don't want to see any red. I don't want to see any blue. That means I'm going to have to explain it to somebody. Um, in reality, when I look at something with everything within the reference interval limits like they are here, I think that's abnormal because I know how normal reference intervals are designed to begin with. Um, if they do look at the numbers, they look at them too strictly related to the reference intervals. And, and this is a big problem in veterinary medicine. The way, if we do it correctly, if we generate the reference interval correctly, covering all the breeds, all the sexes, remember we have four sexes, humans only have two sexes, um, but the dramatic breed differences, uh, if you start gathering all that information, high altitude, low altitude animals, to give a general picture of what the reference interval should be, I think it, it becomes pretty obvious that that ends up with a really broad reference interval that limits our ability to detect some abnormalities. If we deal with a single breed, uh, let's, let's take a research dog, a beagle, which is pretty much a clone of itself in those beagle colonies, you end up having much, much tighter, narrower reference intervals for that particular breed. Eventually, we will get there in veterinary medicine, but 
It's very difficult to do. It's very expensive to do. We need at least 120 to 160 clinically normal animals, well documented over a period of time. And when we did, when we just regenerated our reference intervals, we looked and we tried to make it as broad as possible species, keep the greyhounds out of it, keep the Akitas out of it, because we know they're different. We keep the poodles out of there because they may have macrocytes uh, normally for their family. So we've tried to eliminate some of those, and that leaves us with a reference interval that's really hard to interpret. And, and remember when they're generated. This is a mathematical uh, calculation of a reference interval. And if it's done properly, if you have that population of animals, it's designed as or defined as the mean plus or minus two standard deviations. And they think of your grades in school, your A, Bs, and Cs. There are very few A's and very few F's, and most of the people are in the C range in the middle. Um, that's the way our reference intervals develop as well. We may have to do some mathematical gymnastics to make it fit into this kind of a normal curve, but if we do that, we're still only going to include about 95% of clinically normal animals. It means that 2.5% of your clinically normal animals are going to be high and outside of the reference interval. 2.5% are going to be, 2 are going to be low and outside of the reference interval. That's just if you deal with only wellness patients, you know you're going to see 5% abnormal. And the more tests you do, the greater the chance of you picking up an abnormal result. So if you have a chemistry panel of 10 results, um, you've got almost a 50% chance that there's going to be at least one abnormal parameter or one parameter that's outside of the reference intervals. Um, in addition, related to reference intervals, because we have it so broad, there's an overlapping of the normal or the reference interval clinical normal population, which is the tall peak, and the abnormal or disease patient. And we know that we have a lot of false positives and false negatives in that population. So, so the key is we have to rethink and re remind ourselves about how reference intervals are developed and how we actually should use them. They should only be used as a guideline. Um, there's other ways to look at data. Um, well, if you, if you go to the data set, and I'll stick with the red cells for a little while here, it would give you a lot of parameters, and I'm sure everybody here knows what an RDW is, right? Just nod your head, yes. Uh, I'm going to ask you that with the polling question here in a second. So do we really know what an RDW is? And, and when the questions come up, you'll see a little green box show up in the top right. That means at that point you can choose an answer anytime you want. And if you choose the wrong answer, you can hit another button. Until I push my button, um, you, can, you can change it as many times as you want. I don't care. Uh, go crazy. But again, remember I have your DNA. Um, so the question I'm asking here is, the RDW provides information about which one of the following? Abnormal RBCs, shapes being present, variable red blood cell sizes being present, presence of immature red blood cells, or D, and be honest, I have no clue. And I see only about 12, 15 answers. I want a couple more. Come on, come on. Keep doing it. Well, I'm not going to let you all answer. Um, well, good. About half of you are right. The, the RDW is the red cell distribution width. And you're getting this now in a lot of the in-house analyzers where you may not get it from the reference lab because of the age samples. And what these basically are is a mathematical calculation of the degree of variability of the cell. So it's an objective measure of anisocytosis, variation in red cell size. It doesn't tell you if there's a combination of normal and large cells or small and normal cells. It just tells you that the width of the distribution of red cells is going to vary. If there's more larger cells, you're going to see that curve on the right side have more of a slope outward. And if small, they're going to have a slope inward to, to tell you that there's variation there. And, and the examples on the picture, you can see in most cases, from most of our species, red cells are pretty uniform in size. So we get a nice bell curve uh, distribution, typically. Uh, the dots, as I mentioned before, uh, these are the graphic representations that, that we see. And, and in reality, um, they actually have been play, in place for a long time. Now, even going back to the Vet Auto Read or the Buffy Co-Profile Analyzer, the impedance counters, 
um, the laser sight and the pro sight all have some sort of graphic representation. The problem is the manufacturers actually have given you the opportunity to turn them off. And, and that's, a, that's the easy button, as we say, because if you don't know how to explain something to your client, let's just not show it to them. Uh, so we'll turn it off. Uh, and, and actually, it worked for IDEX as well. We, we didn't have, the I think, the background for our customer support people to actually tell people what this meant because none of, none of the people have been actually educated on this in veterinary schools. I, and I was at the front of the line not teaching veterinary students. My residents in training got it, but not my, not my veterinary students. I, I would like to get a handle on if, if you've had any of those analyzers, the auto read, an impedance counter, the laser sight, or the pro sight, how often do you look at the graphic representation on your, your results from the hematology analyzer? Never, A, and I've got a lot of breakdown there. I think you can read through that pretty quickly um, and see how often you actually use those uh, and not as a placeholder or a, a, a cup dispenser thing. You just do you actually use them? Yeah, good. That's, that's the majority. And, and a couple of people have lied completely. They said greater than 75% of the time. I'm really proud of that. That's very unique. The vast majority of people have never really touched those at all. And, and I'm going to try to go back to these, and I'll show you a couple examples with the pro site on how to use that to your advantage. These actually are giving you information about how that sample was run, that particular patient run, on that analyzer. It tells you whether it worked or didn't work or how things were classified properly. And this should be your starting place with every situation. Now, it's going to take a little learning and go back to your manufacturers to get that, um, but figure out how to use these. We try to give you tools, and, and I think they had some examples of dot plot posters for the, the, the pro site and, uh, that it tells you information about how valid the results are. Quality control materials should be run on a regular basis if you've got availability to that. Um, that gives us a little different information, but those are fixed cells and they don't perform like our animal cells do when we're running them for patient diagnosis. Um, so we need the runs directly from the analyzer and this becomes a huge part of your quality assurance. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little more. I don't want to ignore the microscopic evaluation of the blood film because this is still high value. But now, if you have an instrument that we've documented to prove equal to or better than the big instruments of the reference lab, et cetera, um, we have capabilities of giving you data that's much better than we could ever do in the past. And we eliminate a lot of the things you would do with a blood film to validate the results or to do a manual differential. The manual differential is a pretty weak test, actually. And with the analyzers, we're counting 10, 15,000 leukocytes compared to your 100 cell leukocytes. And that's assuming that you can make a good preparation, the perfect preparation, which is impossible, where the cells are perfectly distributed on the blood film, which is impossible, and you stained it with a perfect made stain, which is impossible. You need all of those just to get to the point where you have an imprecise differential. Um, and that's why reference labs, academic labs, prefer to use the automated differential whenever possible. But they can only use it if the cytogram or the dot plot or the histogram is normally distributed. The cells have been recognized appropriately. Now, there's a reason for looking at the blood film. We spend you know, a good 10 seconds at low magnification way out of the feathered edge. We spend about 10 seconds maximum at the body of the smear. And then we spend well, maybe about a minute or two in the monolayer where we do more evaluation. Um, there's reasons for looking at each of those different areas. So I'm, I'm asking a question here. Which of the following is not, be careful, which of the following is not evaluated at the feathered edge of the blood film? Is it clump, looking for clump platelets, looking for large cells, looking for microfilaria, looking for leukocyte distribution, or looking at red cell morphology? Which one of these is not evaluated at the feathered edge? And again, we do this all in a matter of a few seconds. Now, excellent. Red cell morphology is clearly something we're not going to evaluate. If I show you something very quickly, 
And if I go to a microscope uh, examination and I look at it at, say, 10x, and I'm scanned out here at the feathered edge, I'm going to be looking for all those big things, microfilaria, clump platelets, big leukocytes, abnormal leukocytes. But the cells are so distorted up here that I can't look at red cell morphology. Everything is squished. Even the leukocytes are unidentifiable at that point. So I cannot do morphology out at that point of the smear. So great. Um, as I just mentioned, feathered edge, clump cells, big cells, etc. Don't just look for clump platelets at the feathered edge, though. There's where, that's where you'll see the very large clumps of platelets. Um, so in a typical cat sample, you'll see them out there. You'll see small platelet clumps in the monolayer or at the body of the smear as well. So we scan the whole slide if we're looking for platelet clumping. Um, we're going to look for Rouleau and agglutination at the body of the smear. Again, a very short time period to do that evaluation. It doesn't take long to go get back to a lower magnification and come back here in the body of the smear, it doesn't take long to do that evaluation and look at those preparations. I'm going to look for Rouleau, this Nike row stacking of cells in the preparation. That's what I'd like to see, and I want to be able to differentiate that from agglutination that we might see in an immune-mediated hemolytic disease. In the monolayer, this is where we spend most of the time, and if you heard me, I said, you know, a couple of minutes there. In the perfect world, if you have one of these advanced hematology analyzers where the differentials are giving you tremendous amounts of information already, you do not have to spend much time in the, in the blood film. In fact, I tell people never spend more than one to three minutes looking at a blood film. And the reason for that is the longer you look at it, the more you're going to see that is either of no significance or is not even there. You're going to use your imagination and you're going to start seeing things. You're going to start finding mycoplasma organisms. You're going to find acanthocytes or spherocytes in very, very low numbers. What we want to do is look at the smear and get us a sudden interpretation of what's going on with that particular patient. And if we can't find it quickly, there's no significance to it. So short times on the blood film. What are, what are we going to look for from a morphological standpoint? Well, morphologically, we're going to do the things our instruments can't do. And, and one of the things they cannot do at this point in time, I'm not saying five, ten years from now, we, we won't have that ability even with our instruments. But right now, we can't do that. And red cell morphology changes tell me a lot about the mechanism of an anemia or a pathologic process in those animals. Uh, so there are multiple steps in the process. First, you need to recognize the abnormality, and that's easy to do if you're looking at regular samples because you're going to see a lot of normal red cells out there uh, with your average patients. And they're really quite uniform in size and shape, whether it's a dog or a cat or a horse. You'll know what normal is very quickly so that when abnormal appears and it's very prominent, uh, you can recognize it. The next step is to be able to identify what those are, and, and to begin with, you may be looking at an atlas and trying to figure through the pictures, flip through the pictures, try to find the one that best matches what you're seeing on your slide. But you'll have to give it a name because that's going to be the foundation for reading into what the mechanism of the formation of that abnormality is. Um, so you're going to spend a little time there. You're also going to look for things like inclusions that we're not going to see. Parasites, mycoplasma. Um, Babesia, apparently there is some Babesia up in northern uh, portion of the country. Babesia begemini, basophilic stippling, distemper inclusions, etc. Those can't be identified at this point in time by our analyzers. But I don't want to spend a lot of time looking for these or I'm going to get misinformation. Um, with the white cells, it's similar. Um, we can do a lot with it from a validation standpoint, but I'm going to do most of my validation of numbers using the cytograms to tell me that, yes, it performed properly. But historically, we've had to use the blood film. It was essential for us to identify things like immature neutrophils, banned neutrophils, metamyelocytes, or toxic neutrophils with blue foamy cytoplasm, doli bodies. Those features, the immature and toxic neutrophils, are the hallmark of inflammation. And without the blood film, we were unable to identify them.
um, in many cases, we completely misinterpreted the leukogram. Uh, if you're just relying on neutrophil numbers, that's not enough because the vast majority of our inflammatory processes have normal neutrophil numbers. Um, and the key is finding these immature or toxic neutrophils. And as, uh, if you heard what I said, it was historically we had to use the blood film. That's something new we've introduced in the pro site for over a year ago now, where we've actually come up with a highly sensitive, so meaning that it's in that 85 to 90 percent sensitivity, uh, and highly specific, over 95 percent specific, for the recognition of bands or toxic neutrophils in circulation. This is changing the way we do uh, hematology and veterinary medicine. It's something that's not even available in the human medicine market yet, but it's interesting that the Sysmex Corporation that we're working with is going to take some of the learnings and development we did with the ProSite and they're bringing it into their next generation instrument because they want that there. They don't have that right now. That is a huge improvement in hematology. And, and the analyzer, has, it's been documented a couple of times now. A friend of mine in, in Pisa, Italy, and in Gießen, Germany, have done their own independent studies to document that, yes, those work really well. High sensitivity, high specificity for the presence of bands or not. So let's go to the dot plots and, and kind of figure out how we use them. And, and once again, this is for the pro site. Uh, and, and I'll walk you through a little bit uh, to get through the process. The x-axis is... Uh, the fluorescence scale. I, I didn't mention it, but I, um, uh, I should at least discuss that for a very brief moment. The technology that we have in the pro site is actually three different technologies. We take the advantage of the impedance counters for accurate counting and sizing of cells. We have the flow cytometry like the laser site to give the fingerprint based on light scatter, which is unique for each different cell. And we've added an optical fluorescence. We've put in a fluorescent dye in there that's very, very specific and sensitive for nucleic acids. And most of our analytes or analysis on the dot plots will be related to the RNA content of the cells. And so on the x-axis to the left is where cells would be located if they had no or very minimal amounts of RNA in the cytoplasm. And if they had a lot of RNA, they'd be off to the right. Uh, okay. Understand that? The y-axis actually gives us information about the size of the cells. So if we actually build the dot plots, let's start that, the mature red blood cells are the red dots. And uh, so they're way off to the left because they don't have any RNA, they're just bags of hemoglobin uh, with no RNA, no ability to make more protein or whatever. So they're located in the right place. You might first glance and say that this is a huge spread. There's a lot of variability in size here. However, what we've done is we've stretched out that y-axis to give us as much information as possible. And that helps me characterize things like iron deficiency developing or abnormal red cell production going on. Each dot on the slide, on the, on the dot plot itself, each dot represents a single cell. It's a digitized event of a single cell. So if I pointed out the cell, the dot way up at the top is the largest red blood cell in that sample that was analyzed, and the dot way down at the bottom is the smallest red cell. The vast majority of them are located right here in the middle. And we use about 60,000 cells to characterize this particular dot plot. The vast majority are in that mature red blood cell right in the center of that dense red dot. Now, I'll ask you a question. Where would the reticulocytes be located? I'm going to give you four zones there. Where would the reticulocytes be located? The green button's not on, so you can't push a button yet. But looking at that and understanding what I just described for the dot plot, how would you or what would you predict where the reticulocytes would be located? Zone one, two, four, or three? That's kind of a strange way of doing it, sorry. But one, two, three, or four. And here's the question. One, two, three, or four. Where would they be? Size on the left, y-axis, RNA content on the bottom. Oh, so we're a little confused here, are we? Uh, well, let's, let's go back and, and look at the dot plot, and I'll put the reticulocytes in. Remember the reticulocytes, the big difference between the reticulocytes and the mature red blood cells is the amount of RNA in the cytoplasm. 
They look pale blue on our blood films because that's what RNA will stain uh, in, in with our routine Difquick or Romanowski type stains. So what we should see with the reticulocytes is this kind of spread from the mature red blood cells bleeding off to the right. If you had a profound regenerative anemia, like an immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, you'll see cells way out here that have a lot of RNA in the cytoplasm because they're very immature. And as they mature, they'll get closer and closer to the red cell, the mature red cell mass or a cluster of cells. If I add the platelets in there, I think, again, using the features of size and uh, RNA content, you can kind of predict what's going on there. Platelets are very small, so they are low on the y-axis, and they have very little amounts of RNA, so only the bigger ones are going to have more RNA. So we'll actually see the larger platelets are going to have a little more RNA and further off to the right. So we'll get this very distinctive pattern. The key thing that for you is to recognize that we can accurately separate the red cells from the platelets. And this is huge for cats. We even do a better job than just with flow cytometry on the laser site. Um, it does a dramatic better position. Okay? So I'm going to ask you a question to interpret something. I've got two dot plots here from two patients, uh, and I'm going to ask you which one is showing the reticulocytosis. And I'm, it's, I'm not trying to trick you. Which one of the following supports the presence of a reticulocytosis? And the answers are coming in quick, so I'm going to stop. Good. It, again, it's not rocket science, right? And you said, well, okay, that's fine, well, but why do I need that? Well, just by identifying that that sample on the right has the reticulocytosis is demonstrating that you're validating the data that's generated. If you get a reticulocytosis in a patient that you were not expecting it to be, and the analyzer said there's 200, 300,000 reticulocytes, just looking at the picture right away, you can say, well, yeah, there's a bunch of cells where they're supposed to be col properly colored, so the instrument did identify them as reticulocytes. So you immediately validated something just by looking at the dot plot. And it's easier to do this much more objectively than it is with a diff quick stained slide of a blood film trying to identify polychromasia. My slides are stained with a very standardized Romanowski stain, an automatic stainer, and I have very, very consistent slide-to-slide-to-slide -to -slide -to -slide reliability. But the diff quick or the rapid stains typically don't give you that kind of reproducibility, and, and you'll see that many things look blue if you're, if you're a little too heavy-handed in that third step. Um, okay, so next, why do we have reticulocytes there to begin with? If you've had exposure to the procyte or the laser site, you recognize that we provided reticulocyte count in every dog and cat CBC. Well, that doesn't fit what we were taught. We were taught to look for reticulocytes in certain situations, uh, but we give it to you in all CBCs. And, and you may notice if you use the IDEX reference labs, we also include a reticulocyte count in every one of those dog and cat CBCs as well. So the question is, um, when do you think you should use the reticulocyte count? I, I mean, is, is it D, all of the above, where the hematocrit's normal or increased or decreased? Or is it should be A, when the hematocrit's decreased, or B, increased, or within the reference interval limit C? What situation do you use that reticulocyte count? Okay. And clearly, I've led you down the path here to say, well, there must be a reason, or they wouldn't have done that. But because it costs us to do that. The reference lab, it costs more to do a CBC to provide that in every dog and cat CBC. But you didn't see a jump in $5 for a CBC but when that happened. Um, that's because we truly believe it a value to you not just in the, re in the regenerative anemia. This is the paradigm that we've used in the past. We start off with anemia, then we think about doing a reticulocyte count, and we use that to classify objectively regenerative or non-regenerative. That's a critical step because we want to be able to follow a proper diagnostic protocol to classify further that regenerative anemia and I'm going to use different diagnostic tests in that scenario than I am with a non-regenerative anemia. So it does give us information, but I'm going to try to change that mind. 
I'll give a quick, quick question. It's very quick cases, I mean. Um, Sassy is a five-year-old, long-haired dachshund uh, that came in with a fever of unknown origin for several months periodically. It was uh, on and off, uh, but no other significant clinical signs. Uh, and I'm going to jump right to the lab data. This, this is a full prosite report. Uh, and one thing that I've added to it is I've added a normal pattern for the red cell and the white cell pattern. And we're going to focus on just the red cell. So let's go there. So if we start off just with the numbers, I've got an anemia, a moderately severe anemia. It's down to 15%. That's pretty severe for a dog. It's macrocytic. It's hypochromic. It has the classic profile of what we would have been taught to look for for regenerative anemia. However, I'm, I'm going to qualify that for you because I never knew how often that pattern actually developed during regenerative anemia. So when I joined IDEX, I had an opportunity because every anemic dog and cat, they ran a reticulocyte count. So I had that objective measure in all those cases. And I looked at like a little over 300,000 CBC results and tried to characterize those down. By doing that, I recognized that 92% of the regenerative anemias because of a high reticulocyte count would have been missed if you just use MCV and MCHC. Only a little more than 8% of the cases of regenerative anemia will actually have that pattern of a high MCV and a low MCHC. We can't rely on the indices alone. We have to use the objectivity of the retic count. So in this case, again, Boy, this is nice. It says it's strongly regenerative because the retic count is over three-fold increase above the high end of the reference interval. It's about 320,000 300, in this case, with 110,000 at the upper end of the reference interval. Um, so it's, it's clearly regenerative. But I tell you again, it's your responsibility to question every bit of data and to validate it whenever you can. The dot plot gives me that. You know, is this a regenerative anemia? Is there a reticulocytosis with SASE? I, I, it's hard to argue that. It's exactly where it's supposed to be, and it's very prominent in nature, especially when I compare it to a normal. Um, so in this case, the reticulocytosis is really quite blatant in degree. Um, you'll also notice I have a little different pattern on the red cells. For SASE, there's a lot of cells that are down lower in that pattern of the red cell mass. That's telling, my, uh, telling me I either have microcytes or fragmented cells in the preparation. So I'm actually getting a little morphology just from the dot plot itself, because it's clearly different from, the, from a normal pattern. So that means we should look at the blood film, right? We've got a regenerative anemia, a strongly regenerative anemia, which kind of pushes us towards a hemolytic process. Those are the ones that are perfect for us by looking at the blood film and morphology. Most of our hemolytic processes have good morphologic changes that take place. So I'm going to switch over to Sassy's blood film. And without wasting a lot of time, I'm going to go right to a, a pretty high magnification in, this, in the monolayer area. And, and I think right away, I can document very quickly there's a lot of polychromasia, which adds further support for the reticulocyte count. You can see the low density of cells, which tells me that there's a severe anemia, moderately severe anemia. And then I see all these other little red cell morphologic changes. I'm going to ask you what's the most significant morphologic change seen here with the next question. So look at that briefly. But we've already spent way too much time looking at it already. If you haven't caught it on yet, you're not going to get it. Um, so we'll come back and we'll look at the question, what's the answer to this? Which one of the following is the most important morphologic abnormality for Sassy's blood sample? Is it because there's a lot of polychromasia, uh, a lot of spherocytosis, there's presence of ghost cells? Ooh. I always have to do the ghost thing after I say that. Um, or is there a lot of microcytosis present? Which is the most important morphologic change? All of those are there. Great, spherocytosis. That's right. The, this is primarily filled with a lot of spherocytes. And when we see spherocytes without other types of poikilocytosis, that's strong, strong support for us in, in going towards an immune-mediated hemolytic disease process. Um, the polychromasia is clearly there. Um, I think you can notice that there are a fair number of ghost cells, 
And that's what's giving us the fragmented smaller cells. Uh, remember, there's two ways to get immune destruction of the cells. It's either with antibodies on the surface, which results in the spherocyte formation, or there's complement fixated to the surface. And the end of the complement cascade is boring a little hole in the cells, or many little holes in the cells, and they lose their osmotic ability. And in the case of red cells, the hemoglobin leaks out. So we end up with varying stages of ghost cell formation. Um, so we end up with a spherocyte, but how do we get there? Um, we get there by some abnormality on the red cell membrane. The, the immune system responds to it and, and will send out antibodies directed against those abnormalities or complement will be fixed to the surface. Then the macrophages have FC receptors that will attach to these and they're going to try to remove the whole cell. But these cells are moving and the macrophages are fixed to the wall. They're trying to grab onto these red cells as they're coming through, and they end up taking a tiny pinch off of the cell, which is primarily membrane. And if you do this over and over and over and over again, thousands of times, you end up losing more membrane than cytoplasmic content, and you end up in that spherocyte, which is a rigid sphere that does not have the pliability the red cell must have to survive in circulation. So they're removed quicker, and that's what immune, or that's what hemolytic disease is. It's a shortened lifespan of the cells. These cells will not last long in circulation, and if the bone marrow can respond, it's going to send out more out there. All right. So that's kind of a classic use of the paradigm we're used to. I'd like you to think of it a little differently, and Bailey is going to be my example of why you should do that. So Bailey's a seven-year-old neutered male golden retriever. Um, it, this is a dog that came in to actually Purdue University when we were developing the, the analyzer and it had uh, generalized lymph node enlargement and the aspirate showed lymphoma. So the oncologist had their protocol on the table of, of what was uh, going to be used in that particular patient with generalized just lymph node involvement. There was no organ involvement, no splenomegaly, no hepatomegaly. They feel it was just all peripheral lymph node involvement. And then we get the CBC result. And, and this is one example of many of why you must see that reticulocyte count in the uh, non-anemic animal. This dog has almost a three-fold increase in reticulocyte numbers, 290,000 with 100, 110 up at the top end of the reference interval limit. And the hematocrit is 51, almost 52%. These are the ones that will stymie you, and you'll say, well, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. And you immediately have to call up IDEX and say, well, your, your instrument's not working right. Why would I have 300,000 reticulocyte counts in the face of a completely normal hematocrit? Um, but you have the dot plot in front of you, so you can verify that number very quickly, again, comparing it to normal that you're very familiar with, and, and there's no way to argue that this is a reticulocytosis. I feel highly confident in the analyze that, that that's what the case is. So why would it be there? Well, we go to the blood film. It's always the blood film. We go to Bailey. And I'll just go again to high mag in the, in the big area, in the monolayer, I mean. Uh, and I'll show you that well, first, the density is kind of normal, so not anemic. That makes sense. I see a lot of polychromasia, um, which helps to further support the regenerative picture to it, or the reticulocytosis, sorry. And then I see some red cell morphology changes, at least compared to what I'm used to. And I'll put one, I'll put a couple up here that you can look at in the big picture so you can see that a little closer. Um, so, I'm, again, I'm going to ask you what the primary morphology change is, okay? Are these artifacts? Is it crenation? Something that I see in the reference lab see a lot, primarily because you don't provide us the best sample that we need. Um, think about how often you fill the EDTA tubes correctly. If the tube says it needs a 2.5 mil draw, that means you're not supposed to put one mil in that tube. That causes problems. The longer it sits in that EDTA, the more it's going to shrink because it's going to lose its, uh, its, its water component in the cytoplasm. So we end up seeing crenated cells a lot of times in the reference lab. Um, 
Are these acanthocytes? Are these Heinz bodies? All of those things have little projections from the surface. And let's see, ah, excellent. You're all specialists in hematology, I can see. These are acanthocytes. Um, so now the question behind it, what does that mean? Uh, what are acanthocytes seen with primarily? Splenic disease, liver disease, kidney disease, or lung disease? I'll give you a few seconds, and then we'll, I'll talk about the mechanism very quickly. So I'll stop there. Everybody goes to the spleen first. Uh, the answer is liver. In most of the cases where you see acanthocytes in spleen, it's things like lymphoma or hemangiosarcoma in the spleen, right? Any, anybody say yes? Nobody has to admit that they put spleen, but uh, that's what most people think of. They think of spleen first. If you look very closely at those cases, there's either splenic or hemangiosarcoma metastasis to the liver, or the spleen is so large that it's causing compression on the liver, and we see an impact on the liver itself. The change that we see for formation of acanthocytes is an upset in the lipid relationship between the plasma and the red cell membrane. They're in constant equilibrium. Lipids are coming on and off the outer leaflet of the membrane of the red cell. If you upset the plasma phospholipid to cholesterol ratio, which happens, and if you had to pick an organ, as an organ that has an impact of lipid metabolism, the liver better be at the top of your list. If that upset in phospholipid cholesterol ratio takes place in the plasma, you start loading lipids to the surface of the cell, and we eventually get these funny finger-like projections of varying sizes. And that's what the definition of an acanthocyte is a cell that has two to 10 blunt finger-like projections of varying sizes. Liver should always be considered first. Keep spleen and kidney in the differential, um, but think of that first. Okay, and uh, Bailey's situation, what they did, because they thought of liver, and remember there was no organomegaly, so they did a blind aspirate into the liver that uh, ultrasonographically suggested an infiltrative disease, and they confirmed the presence of lymphoma there as well. Immediately, it changed what they put on the table for therapy. They changed it into a more aggressive therapy because we've now changed the stage of the disease, not just peripheral lymph node involvement. Um, okay, so this is the paradigm you think. I want you to flip that and put reticulocytes at the top of the paradigm. Think reticulocytes first. And, and there's both pathologic and physiologic conditions you have to be aware of. The physiologic ones are the ones that are pretty obvious to you when you're collecting the sample. These are the very excited dogs, excited cats. We'll see it much more in the dog than the other species, but the dog that has good excitement, good epinephrine effect, as I tell the students and everybody else I speak to, that means if I went to your clinic and tried to collect blood, remember I have a, a license to malpractice, so I could guarantee I'll excite that animal a lot because I'm not competent in collecting blood from them. I can get them with the heart pulled out of the chest, I can do it right away, but not on a live animal. So if there's excitement, be careful because with excitement and epinephrine, the spleen contracts. And in the spleen, we have cells, reticulocytes that have left the bone marrow hematopoietic tissue, and now they home to the spleen to finish their maturation process, primarily adding iron to the cells in the form of hemoglobin. And they have receptors as an immature cell to link them to the macrophages so that they can get that iron. If you do splenic contraction with epinephrine, you transiently send them out into circulation. And, and there's a, a really dramatic example of that. Um, my colleague, and many of you must know, Dr. Guillermo Cotto. Uh, Cotto is an oncologist, a hematologist. Uh, Cotto and Nelson internal medicine book. I think many people know him. He does a lot of work with gray, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> with greyhounds. And he suggested after we talked about this, he said, well, why don't we go to a greyhound racetrack and, and we'll test the blood a day before they race and two to three hours after they race and immediately after they race. Uh, and I said, well, but that would definitely do it. But how are you going to get them to do that? the greyhound people will do anything Dr. Cotto asks, uh, and he did that. And you notice that in the, the diagram here, the before, the day before reticulocyte count and the two to three hours after the reticulocyte counts are almost identical. And greyhounds have a lower retic count than most other breeds do. 
So, so, but they're almost identical uh, results after resting after a race. Immediately after the race, you had some dogs with over a 400% increase in retic counts. But two to three hours later, they're back to normal. So we have to be careful about that physiologic or excitement-induced reticulocytosis. The ones I'm more interested in that are valuable to the veterinarian, especially when you're screening normal patients, maybe doing a wellness exam, if you come across a reticulocytosis without anemia, don't ignore all the possibilities for anemia, whether it's hemolytic or blood loss in origin. Think about all of those mechanisms as well in those situations. It's just like uh, the Bailey we just looked at with all the acanthocytes. Uh, that dog had no liver abnormalities on the chemistry panel, had no other changes on the numeric values for the red cells. It was just the reticulocyte count. <clears throat> We've seen Heinz body hemolytic anemia, immune mediated hemolytic anemia. I've seen one case, the most dramatic of all, that had a dog that had a hematocrit somewhere in the mid 40s, around 45 and had an 800,000 reticulocyte count, which is almost the maximum the bone marrow can respond to. Um, this animal, as well as the Heinz body hemolytic anemia, infectious related hemolytic disease, acanthocytosis, mechanical, et cetera, any variety of condition you can see anemia, we can see a compensated or partially compensated hemolytic or mild blood loss uh, in those cases. Look for those because that's giving you information about early disease development. That's going to be one screening of you. And if you look at it closely, you're going to see it in close to 10% of your non-anemic dogs. This is not a random generated number. You're going to see, depending on the type of practice, if you're just doing wellness exams, you may see down to 5%. If you're doing a mixture of mostly wellness with some sick patients, you're going to see up near the 10%. At the universities, we were seeing it close to 15%. So it depends on your population. But the key is you're going to see it in every aspect of veterinary medicine. And here's one more message for you, one more uh, measurement to give you that information. And I've got three minutes. I've only got 60 more slides, uh, but three minutes. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to hit you with one thing related to the white cells because it's had something that's had a huge impact on me and I'll skip right to the end point of the case. Um, I need to tell you about how the dot plots are generated for the white cells first on the pro side. Um, we've switched the scales. Now the fluorescence is on the y-axis, so cells with low fluorescence on the bottom, high fluorescence on the top. So think about the different leukocytes and where you think they may appear. And then the, the x-axis is a sign of kind of complexity of the cytoplasm or granularity of the cytoplasm. I'm saying that kind of because it actually is, gives us more information than that. The neutrophil has the least amount of RNA in the cytoplasm because these are end-stage cells when they leave the marrow. They divide no more. They make no more proteins. They have no reason to have RNA in the cytoplasm. So, and that's where they're going to be. And they're going to be in a really dense cluster there. Uh, eosinophils typically have granules that are characteristic for species, and you're going to see different patterns for different species, but they'll be off to the right compared to the neutrophil because of that complex cytoplasm. In the dog, the basophils have essentially no good granules, but they have more blue cytoplasm, more RNA in the cytoplasm, so they sit up on top of the neutrophils. Then you build the rest of the diagram there. Lymphocytes are above that. They have a lot of RNA, and they may have variable amounts of RNA depending on how reactive they are. If there's a lot of good reactivity, they're going to be even higher. If there's a neoplastic population, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, those cells will not only have increased RNA in the cytoplasm, but they'll also have a lot of increase in DNA. So they're going to go way up, way above even where the monocytes sit. And the monocytes are on top because among the normal leukocytes, they're the least mature. They still have a lot of RNA, a lot of differentiating capabilities, and they get to the macrophages once they get to the tissues. So that's kind of what we're going to use for our analysis. Um, and uh, let me just go Rick, quickly to Blizzard. I'll get to a case that um, is, is, had a huge impact on me just a, just a couple of years or a year ago uh, in how I look at blood films and how I look at dot plots. Blizzard came in, and I'll tell you the bottom line of why it came in. It had a septic pleuritis. 
uh, one side of the chest was uh, either consolidated or filled with fluid, had fever, had a lot of problems dealing with that, but it, it had only been going on for a couple of days. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the CBC, and I'll get to the white cells most importantly there, and you start seeing a series of messages that are included in this particular report. This is part of the enhancement we did with the development of the prosite. First off, you see the numbers are, are low neutrophils, high lymphocytes, high monocytes. <clears throat> well, that, that, I'm, I'm having suspect of, a, of a, probably a bacterial pneumonia or pleuritis based on my clinical assessment. That CBC doesn't make sense to me. So I'm going to have to dissect a little better. But you'll notice that we've given you messages there that says banned suspect presence. What that means is basically there's either immature neutrophils or toxic neutrophils or a combination of both. The hallmark of inflammation. And again, I said high sensitivity, high specificity for those findings. We've also put little asterisks next to things, and those are qualified results. The qualification is saying that the analyzer is struggling between differentiating of some of the cells. All analyzers, whether it's the human or the veterinary market, they're designed to identify normal leukocytes, normal red cells, normal platelets, etc. And when they encounter abnormal cells, it's just like you on the microscope, they struggle in identifying things. And what they do, we've, we've given the prosite the opportunity to at least give you uh, an educated guess on what the numbers should be, but we're telling you to verify those numbers. And we ask you to verify them by either looking at the dot plot or looking at a blood film. And in most cases, just looking at the dot plot in a few seconds, you can either accept or completely decline all the results that are provided. So if we look at the dot plot, and, and I think maybe even you recognize right away there's something different there. I give you the normal one, and if I bring it up onto a little bigger picture, that you recognize that there's nothing where neutrophils should be in blizzard. Blizzard's on the left, and the normal pattern is on the right. And so, well, the numbers were right then. It said 200 neutrophils per microliter, and very, very low count, and I don't see any there. But there's something else abnormal. The pattern in the blue and red, the lymphocyte and monocyte clusters, is abnormal. There's like one population that's kind of stuck in there, and lymphocytes should be over here a little bit to the left, and monocytes should just be up here. So, so I don't know what that population is. It's an abnormal population at this point in time. If you think about the neutrophil and that toxic or banned neutrophil, the one feature that we use that's common to both of those is the increased amount of RNA in the cytoplasm. Because they're immature, in either case, they'll have greater amounts of RNA than the normal neutrophil. And if the y-axis here is fluorescence in RNA, where would the immature toxic neutrophils go? They would move upward in this scale. And, and after looking at just a few samples, even this severely abnormal sample you would suspect as being primarily neutrophils that are toxic and immature. And, and the only way to really characterize that is to look at the blood film uh, or to confirm it. But again, this is not a, uh, I have to spend 10, 20, 30 minutes on it. I scan the slide at low magnification and all I see are neutrophils that are toxic and immature. I see no lymphocytes, I see no monocytes. That supports my suspicion of looking at the sample. I don't even have to do a differential here because I know the vast majority of the cells with my scan are neutrophils that are toxic and immature. So all I do is take that white cell count and say it's 99% neutrophils, there's my neutrophil count. Um, they did look at the chest fluid and something you probably wouldn't like to see. It's filled with bacteria um, and, and a very distinctive bacteria, filamentous branching forms of the actinomyciaceae family. So it's a actinotype case that's there. They went in and debrided uh, the, the pleural surface, very thick and irregular surface. They went in, they cleaned it out as much as they could, um, and, and along with that, they inserted uh, tubes for intrathoracic therapy as well as systemic antibiotic therapy in dealing with this patient. Now, the exciting part about this that had a huge impact on the way I look at blood films now 
is the fact I can now look at serial data both graphically and numerically. And the graphic changes over time I think are going to become highly, highly valuable to you. So there's the, remember this is the first day down in the middle one where everything looks like they're lymphocytes or monocytes. Day two is up in the top left corner and you already start seeing the neutrophils are decreasing. You're starting to see them appear a little bit. And if I look at the blood film, that's where all the toxic immature forms are on day two, just like day one. But if I look at the series of dot plots, I can now start make a story a little bit here. And the story that veterinarians like to tell is, are things uh, either worsening or improving, right? And clearly, when we start treating things, we want them to improve. Even if the improvement has nothing to do with our therapy, we, we want to make sure the animals get better, and we want to document that for our clients. So looking at these series, how would you characterize this? Do you think going from left to right chronologically, is Blizzard's blood work improving or worsening? And that's what the question is going to be. Improving or worsening? Bum, 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 bum. Excellent. Improving. What's the, I mean, you're all experts in looking at these now. There's absolutely no question. That's a dramatic story to tell. And I, and I, and I have told this story many times now, but um, as a pathologist, I always like to show off how good I am. Uh, I mean, pathologists, if you notice their offices, they're always a, they're bigger than normal sized doors. That's just to get our heads through the doorway. Uh, and I felt, I told the medical technologists in our area, I have blood films for these. You're going to stain them with our stainer. I want you to cover up the dates because looking at the series, I know that I can find the cells or the slides that fit those individual patterns. The only sample that I could tell which one fit was the very second day sample. All the others to me, doing a 400 cell differential, and I did it repeatedly because I couldn't believe I couldn't do it, um, I could not match those and characterize those by looking at the blood film. But the dot plots are so vividly clear. I mean, you did better just with the, the brief training you've had interpreting improvement there that I could not touch with the blood film. That's hugely impacted my approach to hematology now. In fact, the only thing I can't see with the dot plots and the white cells from the pro side is I can't tell you if there's hepatozoan organisms in there or anaplasma phagocytophilum organisms or distemper inclusions. I can't do that, but I can screen the blood film to deal with that um, in a very short time. I can pretty much see everything else in there. This is going to be huge in veterinary medicine. Uh, and it's only been out there for a little over a year now. Uh, so this is exciting stuff. Now, I've gone past my time slot. Matt's giving me the evil eye in the back, so I know I have to stop. I, I want to extend my deepest appreciation for you. Coming in the end of a long day, we always appreciate seeing that happening. Uh, thanks, Sash, for letting us come in and, and abuse you. Um, that's always nice. And, and um, I'm just going to wish you good luck with veterinary medicine in the future. This is, this is a great opportunity. Things are changing rapidly from a diagnostic standpoint, and it's our opportunity to embrace it. We have to look at things a little differently. And remember, no matter what hematology analyzer you have, start looking at those graphic representations. Um, you're maybe not going to, well, I know you're not going to get as much information from the pro side, but you can still start looking at them to validate your data. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a good night.